Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Gallery. This is like a, a birthday party where everyone has turned up. <laughs> so we're very pleased to welcome you here to uh, the gallery. We've got a Prado afternoon because we are celebrating uh, the Prado's uh, 200th birthday. It's bicentenary, 200 años del Museo del Prado, and we're delighted uh, to have Miguel Falomir, the director of the Prado, uh, with us uh, for this uh, conversation. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, going to be a little bit like a gypsy wedding that sort of never ends uh, because we're going to continue after our conversation uh, with a lecture by Guys van Hensbergen on Picasso and uh, the Prado. Uh, I hope a good number of you will stay for that. There might be some new people who want to come along if some of the spaces are uh, empty. Uh, and then we've got the uh, projection of a film by the artist filmmaker Alvaro uh, Perdices. Uh, which will take us uh, to the end of the day. So welcome all to the National Gallery, and in particular, welcome uh, Miguel. Uh, Miguel and I were colleagues uh, at the Prado. He became director of the Prado, I think it's about three years ago. Uh, Two now. and a half. Two and a half years ago. And it's fallen to you to uh, organise the activities around the uh, Prado Bicentenary. And we're very interested in your uh, experience of this, because we at the National Gallery uh, sit a little bit behind you um, our bicentenary is coming up in 2024, so we want to get all the information from you. We're going to download uh, all, all your secrets this, uh, this afternoon uh, so that we know how to do it um, very well. But um, why don't you tell us a bit about the uh, celebrations of the bicentenary? Well, first of all, um, let me thank you for inviting me and for celebrating the Prado in, in its bicentennial. This is a very special time for us, so we are deeply grateful to you and the National Gallery. Well, you know... As you have said, I was appointed two years and a half, and my first and main duty in this time has been to organize the bicentennial celebrations. And uh, so it's a very ambitious program with over 100 events and acts, not just focused on Madrid, but throughout the, the, uh, the country. As I will um, insist later, this is one of the main ideas behind the bicentennial is this idea of a national museum, not just because it has the word national in its <laughs> name, Museo Nacional del Prado, but it, because its, it's, its vocation is to be a national museum. So, yeah, it has been very demanding, and, well, you know, be ready to <laughs> work so a lot let's go, in five years. Let's go uh, right back to um, the beginning, uh, 1819, the year of the foundation of the Museo del Prado, and it's uh, a foundation celebrated in this painting. This is a detail from a painting showing uh, Queen uh, Isabel de Braganza, who is considered the founding mother hmm. of the Prado. Well, the, 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 the Prado opened on, on November 19th, 1819, but there were previous attempts to um, open a public museum in, 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 in Madrid, or at least to open the Royal Museum to the public. You know? the, 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 the most important initiative was the so-called Museo Josefino, named after Napoleon's brother, King uh, Jose, King of Spain for a for a few years. That project didn't uh, succeed, and we have to wait another decade before the museum opened. Under the reign of uh, Ferdinand VII, who is beyond any discussion the worst king Spain has ever had, <laughs> and I can tell you that we have had a few really bad kings, <laughs> and probably the only good decision that he took during his tenure was opening the the Prado, probably because he was not the mastermind behind the opening of the museum, was his, 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 his third wife, the, the Portuguese princess Isabel de, de Braganza, that is shown here in a portrait by Bernardo Lopez. She, uh, she died the year before the museum opened, so she couldn't see, but it always has been thought or praised to be the, the, the founding figure behind the, so the she's, museum. So um, she's pointing at the museum yeah. building, which uh, those of you who have visited the Prado will recognize. That's the uh, building as it was, um, this was not built as a, a museum of uh, art in the first place, was it? It was uh, adapted from an existing building. Yeah, this, the, 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 the building was designed by Juan de Villanueva, who was the, the leading Spanish neoclassical architect, and it was designed as a cabinet of natural history, a museum of natural history. It was part of what it was in the, in the, in the, in the last second half of the of the 18th century, the, the Enlightenment, you know, project for Madrid. And it was nearby the um, 
Astronomical Observatory and the um, Botanical Garden, so these three legs of this project. Uh, it was not ever used as such. Uh, when the, um, Napoleon invaded Spain, the, um, the, the, the building was not completed yet. It was occupied by the French troop as barracks. And, uh, and then, you know, there was redone for and readjust to the new function as Museum of, for Fine Arts by Lopez Aguado. And uh, as such, it opened in 1819. Um, it's very interesting because we always talk about ourselves as a museum that's quite different from museums on the continent in particular because our museum was founded uh, really as a result of a, a decision by Parliament to create a, a, a national gallery. Um, this is a royal collection that is opened up uh, as, uh, as, a, as a public collection, uh, still in private ownership, so still belonging to the, the, the monarchs, uh, but uh, open to the public in 1819. Um, a museum for artists, uh, but a museum for the public, and a museum which is meant to uh, bring prestige hmm. to the Spanish Empire as well. Well, the, the, the museum opened with a very um, clear um, nationalistic agenda, you know, it was uh, founded for promoting and defending the Spanish school of painting. So it was a very clear idea, you know, that this, this promotion of, of national pride. Uh, uh, thank God, a few years after its opening, Italian and Flemish paintings began to arrive from the Escorial and other, <coughs> and other um, royal palaces and, 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 and the Prado since the 1830s. Um, has always had this pan-European profile that we are very proud to. Uh, so, but it's true that when it opened, it only displayed works by uh, Spanish painters. And, uh, and yeah, it was a, a, a museum that both the building and the collection uh, belonged to the king. And for 50 years, it was a private collection, you know, the royal collection, open to the public, but still owned by the, the crown. And uh, I think it's important for um, uh, everyone to uh, know and to realize that um, the, the, the Spanish monarchy, of course, had uh, shown a huge interest in painting particularly, uh, commissioning works from uh, Titian directly, from Rubens, from uh, Velázquez, of course, who was court painter uh, to the uh, King of Spain. And so this was the wealth of collections that the uh, monarch, uh, uh, Fernando VII, could draw on when uh, he took the decision with his wife to open the collection to uh, the public. So it's an astonishing sort of uh, amount of treasure to be able to uh, draw on. Um, but the, uh, the Prado has, um, has got other bits of uh, collection in it too, hasn't it? Well, this year we are not just celebrating the bicentennial of the museum, we are also celebrating the, 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 the 150 years of the nationalization of the royal collection. The, uh, the, 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 the monarchy was overthrown in 1868 and a year after the museum was nationalized and became the National Museum of Painting and Sculpture. And we have dedicated to this event a dossier exhibition focused on the painting that you have in the middle of the screen, the shooting of General Torrijos, because it's a painting that somehow um, encapsulates this idea of a national museum. It's the, the only painting we have that it was commissioned by the then Prime Minister, um, Sagasta, for the Prado, for be displayed in the Prado, and for celebrating the conquest of freedom in, in, in Spain. So it's a very emblematic work, and it's the one that tells more about the, the museum as this, this, this national place, you know, for, for displaying the history of the, of the country. So the, the, the very interesting thing about um, the Prado is that it's a very international collection up to about um, 1800, up to about Goya. Um, after that, it becomes fundamentally a Spanish collection. But the very interesting thing is that the um, painting in Spain in the 19th century is predicated on the existence of the Prado. I mean, had mm -hmm. the Prado not existed, um, uh, painting in Spain would have been very, very different. And many of the principal 19th century Spanish painter had a very direct association uh, with the Prado itself, either uh, because they studied there or they worked there or, or, or because they ran the place. Exactly, you know, the, the, the directors of the museum up till the, um, the Second World War, all of them were, were, were painters. So. Torrijos, who is, who is Gisbert, who is the, 
the, the author of this painting. He was director of the Prado and, 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 and many more. And then it's true, you know, the, 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 the Spanish 19th century, uh, the Spanish 19th century painting, it's very self-referential, you know, it's constantly going, looking backwards to, to, to Velázquez and the, the big names of the, of, the, of the golden age of Spanish painting. Yeah, that's one of the most... So um, in 1869, we have the nationalisation of the uh, royal collections, but um, immediately afterwards, there's another great group of works that also enter the Prado uh, collection in 1872 from the National Museum of Painting. Prado was the Royal Museum mm. of Painting, and then you have the uh, National Museum of Painting, and those two collections being brought together in the Prado. Yeah, well, that was important. The, the Museo de la Trinidad was a, a museum that was founded in 1837, 1838, after the confiscation of the properties of the church, with the paintings that were in convents and churches were founded several uh, museums of fine arts throughout the country. In Madrid, the museum that collect paintings from Madrid and the uh, cities nearby was named Museo de la Trinidad because it was in the former convent of the Trinity in Madrid. And this, this, this museum barely lasts for 25 years. It closed in 1872. And uh, its holdings were transferred to the Prado. That was important because although the Prado opened, as I said before, for promoting the Spanish school of painting, it, only, it was mostly the, the royal collection. And in the royal collection, there were works by very few Spanish artists, only those who had work for the court, and most of the, the, the works that the, the museum had were portraits, portraits that they did of members of the royal family. But the, the, for instance, there were none or very few works by, by El Greco, by Murillo, but all the you know, leading uh, painters of the Golden Age. And all these paintings came from the Museo de la Trinidad. So that's what, why uh, it was so important for the Prado and its collections, the, the, the merging of the two museums. So at, at a stroke, the uh, Prado almost doubles in size, this vast quantity of works of uh, uh, paintings which had mostly, as you say, come from uh, the churches and convents, mostly of, from Castile, mm -hmm. um, but often very, very large pictures, series of paintings, um, a huge number of works. And this, pre this presents quite a problem for the Prado in the 1870s, doesn't it? Yep. Well, as a result of that, you know, the, 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 the Prado collapse it couldn't fit all these works. So the decision that it was taken was to um, send most of most thousands of these paintings as permanent deposits to um, local museums of fine arts and you know important governmental buildings throughout the country. This started in the 1870s, and as a result of that, right now, the Prado has more than 3,000 works of art in permanent deposit, in, in, mostly in, in museums throughout the country. Um, so how do you explain, Miguel, um, the Prado is sometimes described as a, as a museum of painters rather than a museum of paintings. There's a huge number yeah. of paintings in the Prado collection. So what, what does that um, phrase, which is quite well, commonly yeah. used about the Prado, what uh, well, does it mean? I, 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 because I think that although the, the, the Prado and, and, and the National Gallery opened within five years of difference, but I think that are very different museums. Ours is mostly... The former, the former royal collection, a collection that was done in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century by kings who loved painting, but who didn't pretend to provide a comprehensive approach to the history of, of, of Western painting. You know, they collected the, the, the artists they liked, and they tried to get as many works they could from their favorite artists. As a result of that, what we have, we usually have more than any other museum. We have <laughs> by far the largest collection of not just Spanish painters such as Goya or Velázquez, but also we have 99 works by, by Rubens, the largest collection of Titian, and uh, Bosque, and so on. But we also have some um, weak points in our collection because, you know, the, 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 the painters that the kings didn't like, they didn't collect them. And, and one of the, no, but, the, but what's happened with the Spanish kings is that they were extremely coherent with the kind of painting that they liked. You know, they started collecting Titian, and somehow Titian, as someone said, was the, the, the father of the Prado, because he was the, the, the key stone around it 
the, the, the kings built up the royal collection. They collected those artists who were closer to Titian, those who privileged color, color over diseño. So that's why we have an, an amazing collection of, of Venetian uh, 16th century uh, painting. We have uh, Rubens, we have Van Dyck, we have, um, uh, we have um, uh, Velázquez, but we don't have or we have a smaller collection of Florentine, for instance, 16th century painting. No? So this is why, you know, if, if you like any of the, of, of the painters that are well represented in the Prado, it's, it's, it's amazing, the experience of, of, of visiting the, the, the museum. And that's why it has always said that the, that the Prado is, is a, a, a museum of of painters rather than a museum of, of, of I have to point out, you've got a very small collection of British painting <laughs> very at the Prado. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the collection, in, in the case of the, of the Prado, the problem with the Prado is that when it opens, Spain uh, lost its empire in, in America, it lost its influence, and became a second rank uh, European country. You know, in the, from the 1819 onwards, you know, the, uh, the, the Spanish, uh, the Museo del Prado or the Spanish collectors or the Spanish monarchy, they, they couldn't compete with the American, European museums and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and collectors. So, you know, we couldn't do the kind of, 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 of collections that were being done, for instance, in, in, uh, in UK, you know? so. The, 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 the paintings that were not collected before 1800, it's really hard to find yeah. <laughs> in, in Spain. So that's happened with British painting or it happens with the Quattrocento painting, you know, a kind of painting that began to be collected around 1800, you know, when we have a small, squeezed, but a small collection of Quattrocento paintings because, you know, yeah. in the 19th century we couldn't compete or with the Dutch painting due to political uh, circumstances. Sure. We were in war <laughs> with the Dutch Republic and, and that explains why we have just one work by Rembrandt and 99 by Rubens. Yeah, and I, you know, if you've got 50 Titians and 50 Velasquezes and 200 Goyas, uh, 100 uh, Rubens, doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it is an overwhelming um, sensual experience visiting the Prado. I mean, you, you, you are um, you do sense that a sort of cornucopia of goods, uh, of, of wonderful uh, masterpieces, is just being poured on your head uh, when you walk into the into the museum. You know, with sort of three rooms of El Greco, uh, with a whole wing practically devoted to uh, Goya, with whole sequence of uh, galleries of, of uh, Titian and uh, Velasquez, and of course, you know, they're very very finest works in that collection too. Uh, Hieronymus Bosch, who had a very little direct connection with uh, Spain. Uh, is best represented in the Prado uh, compared to any other museum. In fact, he's got a Spanish name. He's known as El Bosco, um, which some people think of as a sort of bullfighter's name. Um, <clears throat> so um, just looking at the history of the Prado, very significant uh, event um, around the uh, Civil War, which is very significant for the history of the, uh, of the Prado, and actually quite significant for us here at the National Gallery, who we had to do our evacuation uh, very soon after the uh, Spanish Civil War, and a lot of the protocols that were established uh, during the Spanish Civil War for the safe removal of works from museums to safety at times of conflict uh, were uh, very uh, valuable, let's put it that way, for uh, the National Gallery and for other museums when the Second World War broke out. Yeah, again, you know, this year we are celebrating the 80th anniversary of the ending of the, of the Civil War that it has been by far the darkest moment in the history of the, <coughs> of the museum. The museum was closed for three years, and the paintings, or most of, 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 of the paintings, followed the government that left Madrid, moved to Valencia, then to Catalonia. And the paintings followed the same path, and before the ending of the, of, of the war, they were uh, sent to Switzerland and they stayed there for, for, for a, a few months. There was a, an amazing exhibition at, at the Geneva Museum of Fine Arts. I've always have said that probably was the, the best temporary exhibition ever done because we're 
the holdings of the Prado, Las Meninas, uh, the Equestrian portrait of Titian. And then the paintings came back to uh, Spain. It was a miracle that nothing happened. You know, all of them returned, a few with uh, some damages, but, but, but nothing quite remarkable. And it's a decision that it has been very controversial. You know, the, the, those who support the idea of, of, of uh, the paintings living in Madrid have always um, argued that they were safer outside the city that was under siege by the Franco troops. It's true that a few bombs fall into the, into the museum. But it's, 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 it's probably that's not the, the main idea because probably the, the paintings were, would be safer in the vaults of the Banco de España. No? Probably the main reason behind the, the, the idea of the paintings following the government is the fact that the, the having the paintings close gave to the government an extra legitimacy. You know, that's the, you know, like the, the Prado by then had a, a value that it was more than the aesthetic value. It was something that it was connected with the, with the very idea of the, the soul of the, of the country. You have to remind that the then president of the republic said that had, been, had said a few days before the, the beginning of the war that the, the, the Museo del Prado was more important than the republic of the monarchy. So that's probably the, 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 the reason why the government wanted to have the paintings um, as close as they could. It has all, some uh, scholars have said that probably the, the government uh, had in mind to sell the paintings in order to make cash for financing the war. There is no evidence at all. So probably the, the most likely explanation is that, you know, there's the prestige that it was connected with the, with the collection. And, uh, and then, yeah, it, it, it became what everybody thought that was going to be something quite exceptional. It was the first time that a whole museum was, was shipped and sent to another place. Suddenly became, you know, routine a few months after the ending of the Civil War with the uh, beginning of the Second World War. And in, in, in a few weeks, we have a, a congress in, in, in Madrid about it. And I think that there are members of your staff sure. coming to Madrid to lecture about the experience of the National Gallery. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, one of our um, curators at the time, Neil McLaren, uh, was involved with the international panel uh, that was convoked by the uh, Spanish Republic to oversee the, the safe uh, uh, transport of, uh, of works. Uh, the looking after the works during the, during the Spanish Civil War. You mentioned that phrase of Manuel Lafaña, the uh, president of the Spanish Republic in the, six, in the 1930s, who said that the Prado was more uh, important, uh, you said it so eloquently, more important than the, the monarchy and the, uh, and the Republic combined. Do, I mean, for Spaniards, um, the, the Prado really is the most important thing in Spain. Well, probably, you know, if you were a supporter of the Real Madrid, they would say that the Real Madrid is more <laughs> important than the, than the Museo del Prado. But, yeah, it's, it's something, yeah, quite special for a Spaniard. I would say that the Museo del Prado is, is a museum. It's a very fine museum of all masters. But at least for a Spaniard, it's something else. It's, it's this, this place of memory, as Ramon Gaya, an artist, um, an artist, Call it, and uh, and that's the way how we celebrated it in the in the opening, in the in the exhibition that opened the, the bicentennial. You know, it's it's the, the way how the the, the 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 history of the country and the history of the of the institution intertwine is something quite unique. You know, and for many Spaniards, you know, the, the Prado encapsulates the, the best of our history. You know, and and they are proud to that we 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 exist. <laughs> So let's, um, let's move into um, our own uh, times. Um, this is the image of the Prado extension designed by the uh, Navarre architect Rafael Moneo and opened in 2007. Um, I was working at the Prado at the time. We were colleagues uh, together. This was a very remarkable moment for the Prado. It was a moment of expansion. <coughs> it was a moment when the Prado was looking to uh, extend itself uh, internationally. Uh, it was looking to, um, to uh, uh, create uh, uh, new facilities uh, so that um, the uh, conservation and scientific studies could be uh, taken to the very uh, highest uh, level of um, expertise. Uh, it was really a, a, a moment when the Prado was expanding in every sense. And I think the construction 
of the extension uh, actually um, uh, sort of really lies at the center of this transformation of the Prado uh, during the early 2000s. Yeah, well, the, you, have to, you have to think that the, that the museum as the country had been, you know, somehow isolated from the, the rest of the Europe during the Franco regime for 40 years. And I would say that the, the, the years um, immediately after his death were not the best for the Prado either. You know, we had, I joined the Prado in, in 1997 and, and I can tell you that that was a, a museum in, in very bad conditions in any way, you know, but also in terms of the, of the architecture, the, the infrastructures of the, of, the, of the museum. And it's true that starting in 10 years before 2007, around 1995, 96, finally the, 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 the politicians realized that something had to be done with, with the Prado. We were in the, in the front pages of the international media, you know, because, you know, there were leaks in front of Las Meninas, you know, every two weeks and then nothing worked. I remember that time and it was sad and hard times. So there, was a, there was a revolving door director situation as well, well wasn't yeah, there? Well, was yeah. the, the, you know, Vain director was the most difficult, <laughs> the most risky position in Spain. Few of them, <laughs> it's true, you know, few, few of them lasted more than, than 100 days. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah it was, 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 was incredible. I remember, I was in, in I think, the, a front page in the, in the Den Herald Tribune saying, you know, the, the Museo del Prado, the Sikh Museum of Europe, you know. So it's, that's how the situation was then. So, but at the end, you know, as I was telling you, the, the politicians realized that something had to be done. They, the, dif the different political parties subscribed a pact that they decided to put the museum aside for any political quarrel. And uh, they realized that they have to, to transform the, the building and uh, modernize it. And then that an addition had to be added to, or had to be built. And after, you know, many problems. At the end, Rafael Moneo, the Spanish architect, was the one who was chosen for designing the extension. That it was, it was very important for us because finally we, we got a proper spaces for, for a laboratory, for temporary exhibitions, for the conservation workshop, for the storerooms. Um, I remember when, when, when Gabriele joined the museum, every time that we did a temporary exhibition, we had to dismantle the main gallery. Um, the, the conservation workshop were in, in galleries, you know, they were occupying galleries and so on. So yeah, this, this was important because it provided us with these spaces that allow us to, to, to compete with our colleagues you know, abroad. And, uh, and this was probably the, the, the physical transformation of the, of, the, of the museum, of the institution. There was also a very important legal transformation of the museum. The Museo del Prado got its own law. It was the first um, cultural institution in Spain that got a specific law. It's the so-called Prado law. And this law gave the Prado an autonomy that it didn't have before. Thanks to this law, we, uh, we were able to raise funds in the past. Every penny that we made from the tickets went straight to the Minister of Culture uh, when, when the museum closed. And uh, it gave the direction of the museum more power and more autonomy. And uh, so it has been absolutely vital and, and for, for us. Um, let's come up to the uh, centenary itself, and yeah. uh, you'll have noticed, all of you, that uh, both Miguel and I are wearing the uh, 200 <laughs> años uh, badge, um, but it looks as if it was uh, Monet's building that inspired the design of the, yeah. of the celebratory badge. Well, the, the, um, the, um, that was, I, uh, as I said, my main duty when I was appointed director, and, and we were thinking about what we can do with not too much time and and shortage of money, <laughs> I have to say. The, the, no, it's, well, probably many of you are aware about the, the, the peculiarity of the Spanish political situation right now. With, with, right now we don't have a government or, or we have a provisional government. We have had uh, two budgets in four years. So the, the, let's say that the political situation doesn't help at all. So even so, you know, <laughs> No, no I know that it, no comments. it, it no might comments, yeah. sound familiar to you <laughs> for other reasons, but you know. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we began to work, and, and what we have was a very clear 
you know, idea that, that what was going to be the, 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 the main idea behind the, 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 the bicentennial was, to, you know, to recall the, mostly the Spanish population that the Prado belongs to everybody, you know, everybody in both in a geographical and in a social sense, you know, that it's a museum that is located in Madrid, but it's not a Madrileño museum, you know, it belongs to every Spaniard, but also the idea that it belongs to, to everybody, not just the elite or the medium class that is, you know, the kind of, 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 of the profile of the, or the average profile of the public we have, no? And these have been the two main ideas, no? And according with them, we have designed a very ambitious exhibition program and many more um, activities. And well, this that the one that you have in the screen, it's the, it's the, um, the, uh, the exhibition that opened the the, uh, the, uh, the bicentennial. In designing the the, uh, the exhibition program, first I thought that you know we had to start with an exhibition celebrating and telling the history of the institution in these 200 years. Is this uh, exhibition, Museo del Prado, a place of memory? It's this, this, this idea taken from the, the sentence by Ramon Gaya that you have there. And it was a, an exhibition with around 160 pieces following the history of the, of the, of the museum since it opened in 1819 till now. Um, highlighting the, the milestones in the history of the museum, but also showing the deep impact that the Prado has had in the development of Western painting. How, you know, the uh, discovery of the Prado was fundamental for the, for, for instance, the French Impressionists, or, you know, the relationship that, you know, Picasso and other, you know, 20th century artists have always had with the, with the Prado, Francis Bacon, and so on. So that was the, the, the exhibition that opened the, 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 um, the, the bicentennial. And then we thought in exhibitions that somehow could fill the, 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 the gaps in the collection. As I have said before, we are a wonderful museum, but we have some weak points. The two main ones are the Quattrocento painting, for the reasons that I told you before, so we have done this exhibition on Fra Angelico and the beginnings of the of, uh, re uh, Renaissance in, in, in Florence. We have uh, a small but exquisite group of paintings by, by Fra Angelico, so that was the, the core of the exhibition. It was curated by Carl Brandon Stelke. We don't have a, a specialist on, on Quattrocento painting, and well, it has been a, a very successful one. And the other is this exhibition that we have done um, in close collaboration with the Rijn Museum in Amsterdam about the golden ages of Spanish and, and, and Dutch painting. It's a, an exhibition that it has been created by Alejandro Vergara. It closed yesterday with more than 450,000 uh, 450, visitors. And uh, it's, uh, it's an exhibition that it has, um, it, 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 it had a, a, not just an aesthetic Proposed, but also a political idea behind. No, the 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 Spanish and Dutch painting has always been presented as as the the opposite. No, that you know, one was done in a very very Catholic uh, country and by a monarchy. The other was you know um, in, in 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 a mostly Protestant country in a republic with the merchants instead of of nobility and. Uh, we don't ignore the many differences between the two schools of paintings, but instead of <coughs> highlighting the difference, we have highlighted the, the, the coincidence and, and, and telling that there is a common ground between the two of them. And, uh, and uh, well, it has been quite interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, um, you've got it on screen, the Frangelico. Um, I think one of the things that's remarkable about the Prado is that um, the pictures are um, physically in excellent shape as a general rule, and that's largely because they're commissioned by uh, the King of Spain, uh, they stay in the Royal Palace, and then they move to the Prado, and that's it. Uh, there's no kind of more history yeah. than that in a way. So the works have been um, either very, very well looked after or sort of benignly neglected, mm. uh, which means that they come down to us in, in very, very good shape. 
And when uh, a major restoration project is undertaken, and you can see the uh, Frangelico there. The Frangelico came into the uh, Spanish Royal Collection in, in, the, in the 17th century. Um, but the uh, conservation of the picture, I think, has, has shown the picture um, in all its uh, magnificence and uh, glory. And you can see uh, the colors uh, shining out there. Um, this happens again and again uh, when uh, pictures are uh, cleaned uh, at the Prado, because generally speaking, they preserve their skin. The, uh, the Prado conservatives always talk about the picture's skin, uh, and that skin has been preserved. It hasn't been removed through uh, excessive cleaning or through uh, excessive cleanings over history as works have passed from one owner to another, from one dealer to another. Uh, and that's definitely one of the most exciting. And I described the, visiting the Prado before as a sort of sensual experience. And I think that, that sort of quality of uh, the, 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 the works conserving all their, uh, all their characteristics, conserving their surface, the richness of the color, uh, the quality of the, the brushstroke and so on does make it a very, uh, a very sensual experience. Um, shall we um, look at one or two of the other things that you've done for the bicentenary? Well, we have a couple of exhibitions for the opening in the in the in the coming weeks that are the the, the last two major exhibitions scheduled for the bicentennial. One it's on two uh, female artists, Sofonisba and Lavinia. That's um, uh, if, if the Quattrocento, the lack of Quattrocento paintings and Dutch paintings is something that is very specific, specific from the Prado, the, 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 the absence of female artists is something that we share with almost every other museum in the world. So we, we try to, to, to somehow fill that up with this exhibition on Sophonisba and Lavinia. We have a strong collection on Sophonisba because she, she, she lived in Spain and uh, she was one of the maidens of the, of the Queen Isabella uh, of Valois. And uh, while we don't have any work by Lavinia, but the idea is to show two women, two female artists who understood and practiced the painting in completely different ways. One was a, 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 a non-professional painter, such as a Sophonisba, who focused herself mostly on, on portraits and self-portraits, while the other, Lavinia, was a, a professional painter who competed with, his, with her male colleagues and who practiced every genre, including mythological painting. Somehow, you know, she, she is the closest president to, to Artemisia Gentileschi. No? Who, will and, be, who we will be celebrating in March <laughs> here at the National Gallery. And the other <coughs> exhibition is on Goya's drawings. Um, Goya was um, by far the most important Spanish living artist when the Prado opened on, in, in 1819. So we, we, we have never done an exhibition focused on his drawings, and we have, we have 500 drawings by him. <laughs> so, so this is going to be a, a, a very special um, exhibition. It's probably the, the, the artist that since the last crisis arrived in 2008, probably the, the artist that, among the artists better represented at the Prado, the one that, I don't know, connects better with the, uh, con our contemporary yeah. sensibility. Yeah. And uh, so you could realize that we have noticed how he has become even more important than he was in the, in the last decade or so. So that's coming up very soon. I'm gonna shoot ahead to um, the uh, touring uh, element of the of the uh, celebrations because you're very conscious that you're a museum for all of Spain and uh, you're taking pictures um, around the country. Uh, yes. There's a selection of works that you'll be showing in different uh, uh, capital cities of the uh, well, autonomous this, regions. Yeah, this idea of celebrating the Prado as a national museum, um, well, I've already mentioned it, that we have more than 3,000 uh, paintings in deposit in, throughout the, the country, but in the idea to reinforce this, we thought that the best way to do so was taking a masterpiece to every region in Spain. That means 18 uh, stages in this, in this, in this project touring uh, Spain. And uh, when we have tried to, to, to choose small cities instead of large cities, we have not visited Barcelona or Valencia or Bilbao, but smaller places, where you know many times the, 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 their citizens have never had the chance to admire one of these masterpieces. And I have to say that it has been, or it is been, by far the most rewarding project in the, in the, in the, in the bicentennial. I, 
I strongly recommend you to do something. Like okay. This. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes. Um, can we um, talk a little bit about the future of the Prado? Because uh, the Prado is always uh, in movement, it's always growing, it's acquiring new uh, collections, but it's also acquiring new buildings. And the Prado is becoming not just a museum, but in uh, the last 20 years we've been talking about the Prado as a, a museum campus. Yeah, well, the, 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 the main project in the horizon of the museum is, is, is completing the, the extension of the Prado with the addition of a, a fifth building. We, you can see the main building by, by Villanueva, the extension designed by, by uh, Moneo. The two of them are connected through a path. Then we have uh, the administration office, the Casón del Buen Retiro that housed the, 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 the library, the archive, the, the, the brain of the museum, the offices of the curators. And, uh, and then a few years ago, the government gave us this other building that used to house the Army Museum. The Army Museum was transferred to Toledo and this building was given to us. Both the, this new building and the Casón del Buen Retiro are the only two remaining parts of the former palace of the Buen Retiro, a palace that was destroyed during the French invasion, the Napoleon invasion, and shortly afterwards. And, uh, and well, there was an, um, an international architectural competition that it was won by by Norman Foster and Carlos Rubio, and, uh, and now I am struggling with the government in order to get funds for <laughs> financing it, and uh, the works are supposed to last four years, and, uh, and we, we want to believe that with the coming budget we will get finally the, the funds. It's not a very expensive project, but it's important for us because the, in the same way that I told Sorry. you before that the, that the, the, the Moneo extension uh, provided the spaces for services. It was not, it didn't provide the spaces for displaying more paintings. And we have at least around 300 very high quality paintings in the storerooms that should be displayed. And the place for displaying these paintings is the, the, the so-called Hall of Realms. And, and the, the most amazing thing is that we have the paintings that used to be displayed in that building, including you know, the, the Hall of Realms that was the, the most emblematic part of the, of the palace with the five equestrian portraits by, by Velázquez, the surrounded of Breda by Velázquez plus many other paintings. So the idea is to recreate, uh, you know, that, that palace with the very same um, paintings that used to be displayed there. And, and, and then one of the most, um, I think, attractive aspects of, 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 Mon, uh, of uh, Foster's project is that he turns pedestrian the spaces between the different buildings. So it will become uh, a, a true campus. And he, he's very respectful with the, with the historical part of the building, that are the two lower tiers. But then the, the, the upper one was added by, by, by in, the, in the very beginning of the 20th century. He, he totally dismantled it and create this very spectacular gallery, 85 meter long, 17 and a half meters wide. That's an open space that I'm thinking about moving there, the temporary exhibition. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we'll see. So um, he, here's some um, images of the uh, interior, as it now is, on the left-hand side. This is the room uh, for which Velasquez painted his equestrian portraits and the uh, surrender of Breda, which mm -hmm. is somewhere Supposed, along there. Yeah. Well, Somewhere it's called the, the Hall of Realms because, because the, in, the, in, the, in the painting decoration they display the coat of arms of the different ranks of the Spanish monarchy. You know? and, uh, and yeah, and there, there were you know, the, 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 the portraits of the, of the, the king, the queen, and, and, and his, his predecessors. The, the 12 uh, scenes depicting uh, battles won by the Spanish monarchy and the 12 works of Hercules because the... Um, okay. Spanish kings pretend to descend from Hercules, who two of his works took place in the, uh, in the Spanish peninsula, in the peninsula Iberica. So that's the reason why they somehow connected with, the, with so Hercules. Th those, of you who have, those of you who have uh, studied with um, uh, the, the um, a Palace for a King by uh, Jonathan Brown and John Eliot, uh, that amazing piece of uh, art historical uh, and historical research dating from uh, the 1980s uh, will know that that was the sort of um, uh, historical reconstruction 
of the Hall of Realms and of the Palacio del Buen Retiro. Um, now here we are, a sort of generation and a bit later, uh, looking to uh, that being uh, reconstructed. It's very remarkable. We have the building, we have the interior decoration, and we have all the uh, paintings. It is a remarkable opportunity. And this is what you will be leading uh, in the next few years. Um, when, when do you hope it will happen, Miguel? When, when can we come and celebrate the opening of the Hall of Realms? Well, once it starts, it's supposed to last four years. It is also true that it's an historical building. You know when you start, you don't know <laughs> what you are going to find. But yeah, I want to believe that in five years, we could... Very good. So just as we're celebrating our bicentenary, yeah. um, we're, we're, <laughs> we can jump on an easy jet flight and come and celebrate your opening. Um, I'd like to um, close with some of the projects that we've done together, uh, Miguel, recently and uh, looking, uh, looking ahead to... Um, there is a special relationship, actually, between uh, the Prado and the National Gallery, and there has been for many years. Um, our collections, in some ways, are uh, sort of plug into each other very nicely. We've got a very strong group of Velasquez. We've got a very strong group of uh, paintings by uh, uh, Rubens. We have superb paintings by Titian, often from the same set. Um, and it's an opportunity to work together, both at curatorial level, but also in terms of uh, research on uh, the conservation history of the collections. And just looking back, this in fact is a show uh, that uh, happened uh, both at the Prado, slightly different, and at the National Gallery. Some of you may remember the Titian show uh, we did here in the Saints Ring in 2002. And then very shortly afterwards, it was shown uh, at the Prado, with the Prado kind of pulling out uh, all their big guns uh, from, uh, from their own uh, uh, collection. And that was a very uh, happy uh, collaboration. Uh, and this show here, Miguel, which you also um, yeah, uh, curated, faces, um, yeah, and was curated here in London by uh, our deputy director, Susan Foister. Yeah, for us, this, this, this partnership with the National Gallery has been very important. You know, as I said before, the Prado Forum, a while was an isolated museum, and for us, when we we began to realize that we had to open, or that we have to begin to collaborate with with uh, with our colleagues abroad, well, the the, the, the National Gallery was the, the model that we wanted to to follow, and so I think this has been a very fruitful um, partnership, and um, I'm sure it's going to continue. <laughs> yeah. Most recently, of course, we um, celebrated uh, Lorenzo Lotto uh, together. That was an exhibition that happened. Uh, at the Prado and then here, again, you were uh, curating the show together with our own uh, curator, Matthias uh, Vivel. Beautiful, beautiful show, uh, focusing on uh, the uh, remarkable suite of portraits that Lorenzo Lotto uh, created over the uh, course of his career. Uh, it included that beautiful picture, which of course is a, is a Prado uh, painting. And looking ahead, um, this is a very remarkable project that we are working on uh, together. In the spring of next year, we are going to try and bring together uh, Titian's Poesie, that remarkable group of late mythologies that Titian paints in the 1550s uh, for the King of Spain. So sent uh, mostly from Venice to uh, Madrid and uh, constitute this extraordinary reimagining of uh, the stories of the loves of the gods uh, with a uh, sensuality and a, uh, a sort of a, a, a level of sort of painterly commitment uh, that I suppose was, was really unprecedented. Um, these pictures have been uh, dispersed and uh, we're hoping to uh, bring them back together uh, in the spring here uh, in London uh, because we share the two that we have at the National Gallery which are uh, this one here and this one here together with uh, Scotland. Uh, the show will also be seen in Edinburgh, then it will go to uh, the Prado, where the uh, Venus uh, and Adonis is. And finally, the exhibition will also go to Boston, where the remarkable uh, rape of, uh, of Europa is. Uh, that's a remarkable uh, project. It's one that I don't think would be possible unless we'd had the close working relationship we have had uh, for the past 20 years uh, with the Prado Museum. And it's thanks to those uh, special relations between scholars, between curators, between people, that means our institutions can do very, very remarkable things. Uh, I'm looking forward to it hugely. Um, I'm going to draw to a close, but just before we finish, uh, Miguel, 
Um, you've been uh, working at the Prado now for about 20 years, you said? For 20, 22. 22 years. And you've been director for nearly three. What is it that for you, for you personally, is really special about the Prado? Well, I suppose that uh, being as I am a Spaniard, you know, this, this, this connection that goes beyond the, the, the aesthetic, you know, that makes, you know, this sort of attachment between the, 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 the institution, the country, and of course the richness of the collection, but that's what makes it quite unique. Uh, I don't see myself, I'm not, uh, I was not <laughs> a, a museum person, I used to teach at the university, and, and I don't see myself working in another museum except the, the, the Prado, no? it's where, where you know, the, the, the kind of collection that I like to work with, and, and, uh, and yeah, no, it's this, probably this, this emotional attachment with the institution and its history. Very good. Miguel Palomir, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy birthday to you. Thank you.